of 12 months sabbatical from preaching. Mm -hmm. And this is his, uh, his first one. Uh, after 12 months, and it's great to be here. So let's just pray for him before he starts. Thank you, Father, for bringing Mike and Linda back here to Oak Tree. Thank you and praise you for, for the, the, his ministry and his service here today. Give him your words to speak in Jesus' name. Amen. Wonderful. No, you really, you look amazing. You are amazing. You have no idea how much I've missed you. Linda and I, both of us, uh, over the years. Some of you we don't know. But I need to tell you, even those of you who we don't know, that you are a part of a thing that God has done that is very, very special is doing, will continue to do. You have been grafted into uh, a living, breathing reality of church. The, the, we've traveled rather a lot in the last 15 years since we left here, or thereabouts, give or take a bit, uh, and we've never encountered a church like this one. It's different. You are different. Uh, and you are blessed. We've just come from uh, South Carolina. Uh, we've spent the last 10 years there. Uh, it's been an interesting time. We've loved uh, being there. And uh, my, my tenure at this church finished about a year ago, and we've, we've been wandering a bit. But in, in, in South Carolina, I've never been in the South before I went to this church, or the South of the United States. Uh, and it works differently. It really is another country. Uh, and uh, it is called the Bible Belt for good reason, because there are a lot of churches. Uh, there, are, I suspect, are no more Christians per capita than the rest of the country. Uh, but there is a lot of thumping of Bibles and a lot of uh, churches. Uh, we, we've loved it. They have a saying there, though, and I, and I brought this here today because I, I want to just, it, it kind of summed up for me. When I first got there, I was, I was struck by people all the time saying, bless you. Or, uh, and uh, in South Carolina, if they really want to dismiss you and make you feel very small, they say, oh, bless your heart. And you know they don't mean that at all. <laughs> but they also have a saying that says that we are blessed to be a blessing. And that really summed up what I wanted to come and, and speak to you today about. That you are blessed to be a blessing. And that has been, and that is the tenure uh, of Isaiah 61. It is the calling of this place. We just sang about names, the name of Jesus. And names are very important in the Bible. People are named by God for reasons. They're named after people who will become their, uh, their model. They are named after places where God has been at work. They are named for attributes that God has put in them but hasn't yet grown up in them. A name is descriptive. It isn't just a handle, but it actually describes the inside, not just the outside. And our name, because it's us, our name is Oak Tree because God gave us that name. And he gave us that name from this passage 24 years ago. And it is descriptive of what he is doing and has been doing and will continue to do more and more in this church. When I was um, a lot younger, and my children were a lot younger, uh, 
first Matthew and then Matthew and Cortland would ask for stories before we went to bed. Uh, and they would say, tell us a story. Initially, they said, read us a story, but after a while, that became tell us a story. And I can still remember with my oldest son when we were living in South Africa and we had this green uh, Land Rover and we would, we would tell him stories of the boy in the green Jeep. And he would always clamor for those because he was the boy in the green Jeep. You know, and you, you would kind of make, those of you with children will know this, you make the stories up and you, and you know, it's somehow or another the story encompasses some of the things that happened during the day with the, you know, and, and they're, they're really excited about it. I'm going to tell you some of your story. Now, Tim, you very kindly said that this is my first preaching year, but this really isn't. The next one will be the first preach. This is, I'm going to tell you a story. I have a very high regard for preaching, but I'm not going to preach. I'm going to tell you a story. In this story, first, we'll tell you why your name, and secondly, we'll tell you who you are. And the story began on page one of this book, In Creation. Actually, it began a little bit before that. But in order to create this, God had to create the heavens and the earth. And so he began at that stage. And he worked from there. And he worked his way through the history that most of you will know, at least some of, of the people of Israel, until it became apparent that they were off track. And he sent the prophet Isaiah. That was about 725 years before the birth of the Messiah. And God spoke to Isaiah and he said to him, this is what you are to do. And he gave him words to speak. These words were spoken of the exile that was to come, of the difficulties that the people of Israel would encounter as a result of their actions and their misdeeds or their inactions about 250 years later. This exile would not take place for, I think, technically about 225 years later. But Isaiah accurately predicted it. He gave them a choice, an alternative. <laughs> He said, you can do this or you can do this, but if you continue to do this, this will happen. But I want you as the people of Israel to remember that throughout that time, that is not the end. No matter how difficult it gets, no matter how far you have strayed, that you are welcome back. And I will be with you. That's this passage. And he made some promises. 750 years later, give or take, Jesus was born, and then his first sermon. It actually really wasn't a sermon. It was more of a, a comment. He was asked to read this passage, his first public act of ministry. And he read it the very bit that I'm to preach on today. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me. It was on Isaiah when he first proclaimed it, but Jesus read and then he closed the scripture and he said, today in your hearing, the scripture is fulfilled. It was true of Isaiah, but it is even more true of me. It was for those in, those in those days, and it is for you in these days. And then a little short of 2,000 years later, Claire and Adrian Holland, who had formed a small group in the Church of St. Barnabas, were gathered together, I had invited people to consider the possibility of planting a new church. And a number of them had come together. Many of you will remember this 
Many of you will have been part of this. And to explore what we thought God was calling us to do. We got to the stage where we were fairly certain that we were being called to Acton. That we were being called out of St. Barnabas as a church and that we needed to start a new church. And strangely enough, the first question, which was the wrong question, but the first question that came to us is, if we're going to start a new church, what are we going to call ourselves? Now, I look back on it, and that was a dumb question. You know, what are we going to do? Who are we going to be? How are we going to reach out? What, you know, there's a, lots of questions. But the first question that we tackled was, what are we going to call ourselves? You know, everybody's St. John or St. Swithin or St. Melitus or St. something or the other. Are we going to be that or are we going to be something else? And Linda and I went to Adrian and Claire's house group, hub group, if you will, uh, and we, Claire, about halfway through the group, we were considering the question. Claire said, this morning, I had this very strange experience in which I thought God spoke to me. I said, Claire, I've never heard you speak in that language before. You've never said that God spoke to you before. What she said, he never has, to my knowledge. This was her first word of knowledge. And she said, God told her to turn up Isaiah 61, and she did. And she read it to us in this, in this group. And she said, I have no idea what this means, but I think our name is in here. And I heard God's voice coming right through her mouth when she said that. First time ever. And so we read it, and we read it, and we read it, and we read it, and we walked out of there saying, we have to call this church Oak Tree, because God has promised that we will become oaks of righteousness. It was about three days later that I decided to do some research on Acton and discovered that Acton was the Saxon word for oak town. And this used to be an oak forest. Who knew? You know, we had no clue about any of that. Creation, Isaiah, Christ, and Claire Holland. God was calling, creating a people, calling a people, calling a people back, calling a people back again, and then calling a people to Acton for a purpose. I asked those who wanted to go out with us to Acton, to the new Oak Tree Anglican Fellowship, and I asked them all, and I interviewed everyone, I, I knew everybody who came with us. Some of them were <coughs> new to me, but, but we talked together. There were 70 of us with 12 children. And I asked each one to consider going, but, not, but, but I wanted them to know that the answer to whether they should go or they should not go, and my determination of whether they could come or not come, would depend on whether God told them to go. I wanted no one who wasn't absolutely certain that God was calling him to go, because I knew it would be very hard. They had to know that God was calling them, and they had to be able to tell me how they knew and convince me that that was real. It was the most extraordinary bunch of interviews you can imagine. And every single one of them could tell me that. There was no, this is a good idea, or this is a bad idea, or I'm looking for an adventure, or... You know, we were thinking of moving west anyway. I mean, there was none of that. There was, I am called to this. This is what God is telling me to do. And it was a good thing because the bishop who had asked us to do this was constrained in his permission 
he got permission from the uh, General Synod to plant us, but he was constrained by the laws or the rules uh, of the Church of England, which said that no, no one could perform ministry in, under the, the auspices of the Church of England in a parish without the vicar of that parish's permission. The Acton remit contained six parishes. And so the bishop went to all the vicars of all six parishes and said, would you permit uh, this, this group of people to do ministry in your parish? Two of them said, absolutely not. Three of them said, maybe. And one of them said, yes. All we needed was one. So we could then plant in that parish and begin to work around from there. That was about six weeks before the date we had set to start out. We did start out uh, the week before we were ready to start out. The bishop called everybody else, called up all the vicars again. And at that stage, every single one of them said, absolutely not. They hemmed and hawed and they kind of said, well, and they thought of reasons for it. But at the end of the day, and it was pretty clear that they'd all thought that to begin with, but they didn't really want to tell the bishop that. And they thought maybe it would go away before the, you know, the appointed time. So the bishop came to me and said, we have a problem. You can't do anything. You can exist, but you can't exist there where you're called to, and you can't do anything there under your, under your leadership. So we agreed that we would form six house groups, which we did, and we had what we called church in a box, and a couple of you will remember that. We put a dozen Bibles, uh, we put donuts, we put the bulletin for the week, and then everybody went into their group but I couldn't go to any of them because I was the thing that made it church in, in the rules. <laughs> so everybody met and we met week by week for several weeks and then we decided to gather together and we, but we couldn't gather in anybody's parish. So we went to Gunnersbury Park and we had church in the park. And it was the anniversary, the first church in the park was this week, 24 years ago. Uh, and we did that the first week and it was glorious. We did that the second week and it rained <laughs> until 9 o'clock. It, sto it stopped raining. By 10 o'clock, it was as dry as it could be. We had church and then it rained again at 12 o'clock. <laughs> and I thought, this cannot continue. You know, some meteorologist somewhere would, would figure out that there was a spot of blessing in the middle of Guttersbury Park where it never rained year by year, on, you know, week by week and Sunday. Um, I got a phone call uh, the week that I was despairing after three weeks of this from a man named John Bernardi. John Bernardi, some of you will remember, most of you won't, um, was the vicar of the Church of the Ascension on Hanger Hill. And John had been one of those who said absolutely not over my dead body. <coughs> and he called me from hospital. This is the strangest conversation. But he called me from hospital and said, I'm in hospital, I have a thrombosis in my right leg. Um, they say I, I'm okay, but I can't move, and I've tried everybody, and I can't find anybody to take my service on Sunday. I wonder if you would do it. Now, I thought that was pretty cheeky. <laughs> you know, having turned us down, absolutely, and not been very complimentary in the process, to then invite me. But I thought, you know, this is so weird that God must be in it. So I said, John, sure, I'll, I'd, be, I'd love to do that. Um, could I come over and take some notes? You know, I don't know how you do your service and so forth. I brought my 
uh, my, my prayer book with me, uh, my service book, and, and I sat down at, at the foot of his, uh, table, his bed in the, in the hospital, and, uh, and I took notes, and we went through the whole thing as to what he did. He was very high church. So I'm sitting here saying, so how do you do that? He said, well, we elevate the host. And to give you an idea of what the church was like, when we walked in the church, there was a table when I first walked in, and it had a little sign on the table that said, if you wish to communicate today, please put a host in the cyborium. And I thought, this is really welcoming. <laughs> so I'm going to take this guy, and I'm going to find the robot somewhere, and I'm going to... You know, and, and so it was, it was a very strange service. We got finished that, and I said, John, I know this sounds a little strange, but I believe in healing and that God can heal. Would you mind if I prayed for your leg? And maybe I wouldn't have to do this stuff on Sunday, and you could do it. And he looked very skeptical, and he said, sure. And I watched the look in his eye, which said, okay, you're now going to go home, and you're going to get in your prayer closet, and you're going to do something, or, or you're just saying that to be nice or something. And I said, okay, if I'm going to pray for your leg, I actually need to see it. And there was a nurse in there who was kind of hovering around, and we pulled it off, and his, there's his leg up, and it's all wrapped up and everything. And I said, would you mind if I lay hands on it? And, you know, I think he, it was tender and so forth and so uh, the, I said to the nurse what can I do and what can't I do and she she began to sort of unwrap it and show me and I put my hands on it and John was feeling was looking decidedly uncomfortable with all of this and I prayed for it and we had unwrapped it and while I was praying and I probably prayed for maybe five or six minutes and some of you'll be familiar with this process but I just laid my hands on it and I watched in the skin began to ripple across his, his leg, which would, was all discolored. Uh, it, it was black and blue and dark and, and, and swollen. And, and it was like waves were going under the skin. Uh, and then at one stage, it was like uh, worms or something were crawling under it. I mean, it was, you know, you'd see these things going around. I thought, this is really strange. And I kept saying, you know, do it, Lord. Do it, Lord. Do it. You know, <laughs> fix this thing. <laughs> And it got finished, and the swelling had gone down, disappeared. The color was completely natural, and there was nothing visible wrong with the leg. And the nurse was sitting there and didn't know what to do with herself. <laughs> I mean, she was just... And I said that, you know, and both John and I were saying, this is absolutely amazing. So I said to the nurse... I have no idea what's just happened, and I have no idea what the state of this is, but I would be very grateful if you could find a doctor and get John checked out again, in order that if he's okay, which I hope he is, and he might be, which he says couldn't be, if, if he's okay, he can go and take the service on Sunday so I don't have to do it. <laughs> Thank you so much. And she said she would do that. That was on Thursday. On Friday, I got a call from John, who said, I'm fine, I'm home, and I have no trace of thrombosis any longer in my leg whatsoever. And I said, oh, praise God. And he said, would you nonetheless do the service with me? <laughs> and I said, why would you want to do that, John? I'm no good at that kind of thing. And he said, because I want them to know what God's done. Now, hearing that from John Bernardi, and I don't mean to say anything negative about him, but just didn't seem natural. So I said, sure, I'll, I'd be happy to come. What would you like me to do? He said, tell you what, you preach, I'll do the service. That's a deal. You got, you got it. So I came, and... Um, and we showed up, and during the time of announcements, John Bernardi sat there to, to his whole congregation, and he pulled, you, you know, they wear dresses and all of that kind of thing there. They wear these things. By the way, most of you will not know what this is or that, that you, know, don't, you can say all the old oaks are laughing because, 
And I only wore it because I knew you'd laugh. <laughs> um, so we, we had this service, and John explained to them all what had happened. And he, he didn't pull any punches. He said, God healed me. It was, it was amazing. I've never seen anything, never, never expected anything like that. Later that week, Kaz, where are you? Well, Kaz was one of the church wardens. We went, we went, to, um, went to a meeting uh, up at Hangar Hill in which the congregation voted, uh, uh, the, the, sorry, the, the church wardens at the behest of their PCC uh, asked us if we would like to share that building with them. And, 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 share, and John Bernardi asked us if we'd like to share ministry in his parish with him, and that was the beginning of this operation. God only could have made that possible. Kazza laughed because the, the story of exactly how that meeting went was just bizarre. Um, God set this up, and he made it happen in an impossible way in an impossible time when everything else said this could not happen. In this passage, I just want to look at the passage for a minute. If you've got a Bible, turn up 61. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Isaiah spoke God's words. Jesus spoke God's words. Claire Holland spoke God's words. And this church has been speaking God's words ever since. I want you to know that the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on you. He has blessed you to be a blessing to others. The spirit of God is on you to preach good news to the poor. It is often said that this passage was Jesus' job description. It is our job description as well. And look at the words that are in here. He said to preach, to proclaim, to proclaim, to comfort, to bestow, to, um, to rebuild, to renew, to shepherd, and so forth. All the way through this passage, there's one thing after another after another, one verb after another. And those that, that Jesus came to do those things to are the poor and the brokenhearted and the captives and the prisoners, those who grieve, those who are devastated. And he makes a promise. He says he will be this for those people and that as a result of what he does in them and they do in others, they will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. You are oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. We have been that for 24 years now. He envisioned us, he created us, he performed miracles to plant us And we have been doing it for 24 years. We have been releasing. We have been binding up. We have been speaking life and truth into. We have been comforting. We have been building up. We have been restoring people one by one for years and years and many more years to come. 
That's what we were called to. That's what we were made for. That's who we are. Our first Alpha conference, and we've been doing Alpha from the beginning, was held in the library just up the road here. And I can remember the first Alpha when the first person who walked through the door had been heading down to what was the town hall for, what was it, Kaz, uh, Linda? Psychic yeah, psychic fair. And she says, is this a psychic fair? As she walks in the door. And I said, it's close. <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of spiritual. She said, that'll do. And she came on in and went to the first Alpha Conference and got, got converted eventually in the, in the 10 weeks of the Alpha. It was extraordinary. We did it in the library and we, we, um, we, um, they had a room upstairs that we ate upstairs and then, and then uh, took our small groups down in the stacks. We went from there to the, to the um, uh, community center and we did it together with many of the churches in Acton. We were always doing things together, trying to bless them. We were blessed to become a blessing to them. We did the first ever conference, religious conference in Alpha, uh, sorry, in Acton. Uh, and it was the, called the Height and Breadth and Width of Prayer. Uh, and, and we took that straight out of the Bible and the Archbishop of Canterbury this was our first three months. We had no money. We had no standing. Uh, Richard Foster came and spoke to us. The Archbishop of Canterbury came and spoke to us in that. Three nights running. And we did, we, we were, you guys were brilliant because you were invisible. We did all the work. We took all the risk. We put all the money out. We invited everybody. We put the, the big name speakers out there, and then we put all the heads of all the churches in Acton up on the stage, and we never took a, we never appeared. Nothing. It did more for us in Acton than anything you can imagine. Blessed to be a blessing. We did ministry trips, all the things we were learning. And man, we were learning heaps because we were... We didn't know anything when we started out. Sorry, that's, I didn't know anything. You guys probably knew a lot more than I did, but I, we, were, we were really making it up as we went along. And as soon as we'd find something out, every month for 10 years, I took a team out somewhere in the world. Sometimes it was in England, but a lot of times it was all over the world. Sweden, Lars, Norway, we, we, we went to Switzerland, we went to Australia, we went to New Zealand, we went all over the place. And we just shared with them the stuff that God was teaching us. This little thing in Acton was able to spread the heart of God all, literally all over the world. I kept thinking when I was in New York and doing this conference in New York, and I'm sitting there thinking, what am I doing in St. Bart's in New York City with hundreds and hundreds, and in that case, about 1,500 people, and telling them about stuff when we're 100 people at Acton, you know, come on. You know, all the stuff that's been going on in Acton, the refurbishment of the town hall now, uh, the, the center here, even this building and that sort of thing. Some of you will remember, most of you won't, but 25 years ago, this was a different city. This was a place, we came here because this was the worst place on the west side. If you lived here, you said, yes, I have a W3 postcode but actually I live in Chiswick or Ealing or Shepherd's Bush or something. You know, you lied about where you lived because you didn't want to be associated with it. What turned this place around was a regeneration project that began five years into our tenure here. Three years into the tenure, I had 
the, uh, several members of the council, of the evening council, come to me and say, we have been trying to get a regeneration program going in Acton and in, in, in Ealing, but mostly in Acton, for uh, 10 years. We tried one 11 years ago and it failed and we can't get, we can't get it through. We, we, we keep, uh, we've done studies, we've done three studies now and they showed me the studies that said the government will not accept it unless there's some co cohesive community base to this regeneration project. And these studies have all said there is no cohesive community base in Acton except the churches. And we had formed an association of churches, all of the churches, well, almost all the churches in Acton. And we had no idea what that was going to do, but they, the studies all picked up on that and said, this is the community of Acton. It's the only thing where everybody holds together. And so they came to me and said, would you put your name on the front of this, this project? It was called From the Margins to the Mainstream. And it was 47 million pounds worth of regeneration project. European money and all, and all sorts of different kinds of money. But it wasn't going anywhere unless we put our name to it and, and took a role in it. And I said, we can't do that. We're small and weak and poor and don't know anything. And I went to the bishop and I told him about this. And he said, well, actually, that, I'll tell you the truth. They came to me and said, we'd like you to do this. And I said, no. And then they came back to me again and said, we need you to do this because this will not fly, will not go anywhere unless you agree. And I said, no. And then they went to the bishop. And the bishop called me in. This is the truth. And I said, you know, we can't do this. This is so fragile. This is, it looks great on paper, but, but, but it's not real. You know, we don't really like each other that well. And, you know, and we're not that effective. And, you know, if we put this kind of pressure on, it's going to fall apart. He said, so what are you going to tell them? We don't want to do good news? That we are so divisive that we can't work together? The Christian community doesn't care? What are you going to tell them? I said, that didn't sound very good. He said, you're going to tell him yes. <laughs> so I went back and I told him yes. And we worked our way through that for four or five years. And almost everything you see around here that's developed in the last 10 years is a fruit of that regeneration project. You probably didn't know anything about that. It's all behind the scenes stuff. We are called the oak tree, and we are called oaks of righteousness because that is what God has called us to be. He has blessed us to be a blessing to this area. And you are. And I want you to know that there are a lot of oaks that have been through here and have left, including Linda and myself. But what I've discovered is that when you leave, it, do it doesn't leave you. That when you've been called, when you've been planted into this thing, it's still there. And each church, that I've been at several churches afterwards, each church, you could probably go to it. None of them look like this, and none of them are as great as this, I don't think. But every one of them has a, the imprint of that heart. When you go out there and you bring an oak in here, or a, an acorn in here and plant someone in this thing, they will live with that for the rest of their lives, as will you. It is not something you can lose. It is something that God puts in you. Isaiah called the people of Israel, or God called through Isaiah the people of Israel, to become those oaks and promised God's promise. Jesus claimed that same thing and promised an everlasting life to his people. 
And Claire Holland's word has named us and called us, given us a job description and a hope and a promise. We are blessed to be a blessing. Amen.